Thank you, Chris. Uh, so I'm really happy to uh, discuss our recent work on uh, actually both infoways and ways. So uh, hopefully my talk is not uh, very like uh, tedious. So I bring some good image first. So this is my university. So we have a lake and uh, this is tower. It's a water tower. So if you have a chance to visit our university, you will see that. And this is also uh, a street close to the student dorm. And this is uh, our lab. Our lab is uh, the first floor and the third floor. We have two rooms. And this is my lab. We will talk a little bit more later. OK, so today I'm going to talk uh, about the high dimensional data analysis. We mainly use it and work in the past few years. So. For the high dimensional data, for example, if we want to purchase a car, and then we may consider the price, we want to consider how much gas is used since the gas price is very high now, and we may also consider like how much power it is. So this is like combined many factors, or like this is a multivariate decision. And then in terms of uh, simulation, for example, if we want to study a hurricane, and there could be a lot of uh, parameters, a lot of uh, factors we want to consider together. And for such a hacking, it could uh, have uh, individual data for the vapor, for the pressure, for the temperature. We want to see them, see their correlation, and see them continue like uh, together. So I will talk about a few approach we take, especially we focus on parallel colonies. This is a quite uh, largely used in uh, InfoBase and also MDS and a few extensions we worked on in the past few years and then a few very different applications we use and we worked out. So first uh, for the method of uh, multivariant or like, high dimensional data analysis, we have a scale plot matrix, this is quite common and there are also MDS and pair colonies. These two I can uh, talk a little bit more. For the multi-dimensional scaling, it's a projection from high dimensional space to a lower dimensional space. Normally it's 2D or 3D. And we want to have the distance in the projected space it's a relative proportional to the original high dimensional space. So if we project a car data, so each car we have different uh, parameters. And then we project on the 2D. So all those cars, they have similar uh, situation. For example, they have a similar power and they have, looks, maybe not look similar. They don't do the shape and as it here. They should be together and get grouped together in this uh, 2D display. So this is MDS. And uh, for the parallel corners, it's basically it put each dimensional axis via parallel lines. And then we could represent one high dimensional data point as a polyline in that uh, parallel point. For example, this one is a six dimensional data, and uh, the value on each dimension we can read it from each axis. So, this is quite a simple, and if we have uh, more lines, we can just uh, draw it, and then if they get it together, and then those lines they should get together. But then we have a certain like uh, observation. For example, if we just uh, get two dimensions from that parallel columns, we get uh, two uh, parallel axes. This is one example we can get. So those lines actually are quite differently. They have, uh, they all cross one single point in the middle. And uh, actually the cross point in a parallel columns is means the linear in that to the coordinate. So they are collinear. So this is quite easy for us to observe. But if we consider a little bit more complex uh, situation, in the parallel coordinates domains, if we see some pattern like this, probably it's not that easy as the previous example. And it turns out we have, uh, if we put that to uh, axis, like uh, here is the y and here is the x, we found out actually we have four blocks, and then they can be 
like uh, we have a little bit noise put over there. And then if we look at this example, it's very difficult for us to directly recognize it. So the lesson here is in the parallel corners, actually it's easy for us to see the individual value on each dimension, but it's not that easy for us to find the clustering. And uh, for the grouping and the clustering, actually it's much easier to be done in that step forward with the point. So actually this is the, the distribution, the corresponding point representation. So this is the regular Poisson distribution. We can, we see it immediately, we can recognize it, but if we see it from that uh, line representation, actually it's quite difficult. So then we do a little thing change for that uh, parallel coordinates, we embed those points inside. So the idea here is like for each uh, section of this parallel coordinates, we can rotate this one and rotate back. Actually, it becomes that uh, scale plot. At the same time, we, want, we don't want to dis totally destroy the original parallel coordinates. So we use curved lines to connect the new generated point in that uh, subscale plot to the original uh, parallel coordinates lines. So we just uh, do a Okay. What, what, what was that? Can you explain it? Was it just simply? Uh, simply, I rotate. Just actually, for, uh, let me go back here. So, this is a parallel corners. So, this is one dimension. This is another dimension. And then, for here, is we want to define a scale plot over here. And then, we just put to keep this dimension the same. And then, we just rotate that dimension over here. Then, this will become a regular 2D. How do we curve lines, straight lines become curves? Okay, I will talk about the next slide. <laughs> okay, then here, so this is the original parallel corners, and this is the dot, the point we just generate use that scale plot. And then we want to connect them. That actually is pretty simple here. We connect those lines here, and we ask this curve must go through that one. And then we also want to go through to this line. So they must be uh, like C1 continuous. Then it's actually it's easier to define just curve to meet that requirement. Now of course in cer certain situations, the curve may get distorted a little bit. Okay. So, and we can also con further continue if we have two uh, uh, next to each other, so those are scale plot, this is another scale plot. Then here the requirement is just we want this to be continuous. Then we have this continuous line to, uh, we could trace for all the dimensions. Then with this uh, format, we could have, oh, still we have the parallel points, but we can also bring that step out inside. So this is uh, like kind of a hybrid scenes. So in addition to just uh, bring the 2D step out, we could also consider put a few more dimensions. For example, in that uh, space, we can add it to the third dimension. Then that part, actually, we could construct MDS plot. You just any regular MDS uh, uh, commutation waves. And we can also further put the fourth one. So this MDS one, then the connection should be the same. Still, we ask the curve goes through the point, and it also connect to the other two sides of this uh, uh, parallel coordinates lines. The one point here is like, uh, if we want to add uh, another dimension, for example, in this plot, we add two dimensions, and the order of the dimension may impact the final result. But fortunate, uh, actually, fortunately, we found out actually the order doesn't matter, although we see a little bit difference, mainly due to the computational uh, error but they still have this very, very similar version. Of course, they have a certain flipping, but we couldn't control it. We just uh, like enforce it, use the same, uh, same like media access. So it could be controlled, it's stable, and uh, their final uh, form of the clusters will not affect our final like, clustering for the whole data set. So it's a good use. And then we have this one, let's see the video, it's uh, clear. Okay. So start from uh, original one, we can get 
There's a form we call the scanning points in a parallel coordinates. And then let's uh, walk through one example. This is a car data. So each one is uh, one property of a car model, and we can drop in a few parameters, a few dimensions. Then we can see correspondingly in real time how those points actually they cluster each other. And we can also at the same time trace those points to see their distribution along other dimensions. So this get, get a better understanding of the data if we can uh, compare with this one with two separate views with linked uh, like uh, linked views. Okay, we could also do hmm? How you do the clustering? Actually here we really don't use uh, real clustering. The clustering is done by the user selection. It can also be applied use other methods. Here is a mainly is a visual representation. Use a point. We embed the point in that parallel coordinates. So the viewer, the human user, they are more sensitive to the point. That's the new point. So the animation was simply animation actually reflect the change if we add one more dimension or remove another dimension. What is the time then in the animation? Uh, the time actually is just in inflation. Time doesn't matter. Oh, so it's just purely? Yeah, purely interpolation. So we drop one more dimension over there. They change from one configuration of MDS to another configuration of MDS with more dimensions or less dimensions. So this is the kind of the result we could get, and we found out they could uh, split it into a few parts. And from this part, it's much easier for us to do the clustering than we directly do the parallel points. Although parallel points have been done like, quite extensively in uh, InfoBase. And another consideration, actually, is uh, kind of a similar thing we, I and Chris, we talked about like a half, half hour ago. So sometimes we want to look at locally so we want to get some lens or get some uh, uh, something input. But here, we do on the parallel corners. So for the classroom, mainly most of the algorithm reply, is applied for global. However, if we have a more data point, it uh, costs a lot of time <coughs> to compute like for the whole data set. Then it's also possible we could have some interactive tool let the user select which region you want to look at and find out something local. We found out it's a quite uh, like effective. So the idea here is like we can specify certain points. We can put like a magnetic over there and we could define some like a slope or like direction. It can attract some neighboring lines together. And then if those lines, they don't like quite, they are like a solid loop for this direction, then they will not get the effect. But if they are parallel and they're close, they will get attracted to each other. So it's a, like a kind of a magic attractor to <coughs> the planet. And we could also use a repulsive one. But uh, from our experiment, we found out the attractive one actually gets more effective with the repulsive one not getting too much usage here. So for example, this is a, a data set. This is a, like a, a, a man-made data set. We have five dimensions and embedded in a few clusters. We could just locally put this one along this, and then we can see how they get connected with each other. Uh, or like uh, we can put a farm along this uh, lo uh, locally put here. And if we move this one, it's like a light, like project on a back space, we can see how those like bundles, they appear and disappear if we move that attractors. So by this way, we could do an interactive uh, classroom. And uh, it's not only give the user the sense of the final uh, classroom result, it also gives some like uh, the situation, if we move a little bit, how far we can see. For example, if we move that attractor, a little bit higher or lower, and we will see how this class will get changed. This help us to understand the data more. So just to make sure I understand this operator, so basically what this says, two coordinates have similar values that you can cross them together. 
Uh, not, not really. Two, uh, two I have seen the value. Actually, here we specify a direction. Yeah, but that just uh, translates to an on the starting point of the two axes. So if you say these two axes uh, have the similar values, then we normally we see a similar slope and a close. In your parallel coordinates, but if you look at axes, it's you cluster based on which points have the same coordinate range on these two axes. Uh, if we would say not the dimension range, it's more about like, for example, this one, we go the, the direction we specify is this one. And then for all those lines in this direction, they will not get it. Yeah, but they also have different coordinate pairs. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Only, on those only on those two coordinates. Only on those two coordinates. If we're checking data on those two coordinates, yeah. plus the sure. yeah. So, so th this is the like, uh, more like uh, also the range, also the slope. So if this one, they have a slope, similar slope, yes. but uh, they are here, actually they were not getting effective. Yeah, because they have very different coordinates. Yeah. So, but uh, this one works for 2D, and it can extend it to a multiple dimensions if we apply the MDS. But uh, we haven't done that one yet. And uh, no, but then here, here is the MDS and then the yeah. uh, coordinate noise cluster. This is like a, a few things we say we want the user to get more involved and in then explore the way. Instead of like we give them a final results, we want to make those explorative uh, process be more transparent. And it could be on uh, some like uh, multi touch uh, table. Uh, actually, I missed uh, that video here. So, but uh, let, let's uh, go here a little bit then. Still follow that line. For that parallel corners, normally it's workable for like 20 dimension or like 10 dimension. I think it's a common we use. Do we have more dimensions? That would be means that uh, curse of dimension. And if we have too much dimension, we could not fit it in the screen. And another case is like all those dimensions, they may actually affect each other if we consider all of them together. So here, <coughs> Even uh, like data mining, people also consider the subspace uh, class. So here we actually use that uh, MTS plot and combine with tree and the matrix. So we put them together to get a better exploration of the subspace. So consider we have high dimensional space. Although I plot this way, it looks like it's a manifold, but it's not necessary to do that, uh, to be true. So any high dimensional space and uh, we have uh, some metrics, we could build a dimension hierarchy. Of course, it uh, could be a user specified based on their understanding of the data. And then after that hierarchy, based on this hierarchy, we can build a tree. For that tree, each node corresponding to that hierarchy. And then for each uh, node here, we embed an MPS plot over here. So like we have the MPS here, and then we can expand it it's the layout could be a tree or it could be in a other form. So that two actually they are exactly the same. This is the initial <coughs> point and here we also realize that uh, the relationship between all those dimensions, so whether or not that two dimension, they are close, they are like uh, different. And uh, the same thing, we could also map that tree into a matrix. It's like a tree maps. Actually, they're two. They are similar. So, for each uh, each uh, node in that tree, we can map it to that matrix. And let's look at that video here. So, this is the MPS tree here. And then, for each MPS plot, we can select a certain region, like all get a class we are interested in. And then we can see how they are projection in other subdimension space. And we could also click it and see how they compare with other one. We use these lines, then we can check, trace it. So this means they share the same dimension, which part of the dimension is same. And we could merge the node and split the node as what we can run in the tree manipulation. 
And here, it just specify which dimension we want to split. So this is the dimension we want to split. Or could it be a linear layout or a tree layout? And then we can also get convert to a matrix. So for the matrix, actually, this is the some dimension and this some dimension. They define the MPS part here. They could also support navigation and the zoom. So with this way, we can explore much more dimension numbers. And the major point here is it gave us a way to explore the subdimension space. And at the same time, we could compare multiple subdimensional space. So this one is uh, not really haven't published yet. We can submit to the users. could also bring back to a tree. Yeah, we could uh, apply it to uh, some other data set, and uh, this is uh, like a, a 16 dimension. Actually, we should do more. We could uh, work out to some like one dimension. So we are looking for more data set. OK, so above is uh, like a few um, since related to uh, MTS and the Peloponis, we have uh, worked on. And for that one, the major thing is we want to make it easier for users to manipulate the dimensions. So <coughs> the idea we think about is like the user actually, it's much easier to look at those points. Actually, this one is much easier for them to get the classroom. Otherwise, if they look at the lines, we know when we compare the position, actually it's much easier than compared with the slopes. So after that, we think about maybe we could apply those uh, peloton things we use in InfoVase to some part in uh, scientific visualization. So that's the volume transformation. Although like the peloton is already used in uh, high dimensional data uh, uh, transformation. And then, Let's look at how we put those like pet corners together with MPS, how it's used in the transfunction specification. So for the transfunction, everyone knows it. And uh, for the 1D transfunction, we just map the density to the color and the transparency. And then for, for 2D, we could bring up, up another like uh, parameters, for example, the gradient. So this is a few very ordinary paper from here. And then, but if we consider more, that it would be a difficult if we want to look multiple variants simultaneously. Of course, one way is like we could combine two together, together, but it's uh, not uh, that easy. So for example, we could uh, combine the temporal and the pressure, but uh, still, if we want to add more, so it's a uh, kind of things we want to look at. Now, what we want to put is like we put the exactly similar interface for that we use in the information visualization that the point embedded in that parallel corners, we use it for the interface to specify a trans function. So we map that the voxel values of that uh, multivariant volume. So each uh, variant actually is a map to one dimension. And then the background of this, instead of using discretized uh, peloponics, we use continuous peloponics. And then we could also embed a few MPS plots in that. So that MPS plot gives uh, some like uh, rough idea how they, they are like uh, uh, those uh, values get distributed if we consider multiple uh, variants. Note here, we could also introduce those weights so basically, for different weights, uh, different variants, we could give uh, different weights. So if you do MPS, how do you scale the different variables? There are two different units, depending on how you scale yeah, that's the true. different embedding, right? Yeah, so basically, we uh, normally we do is like uh, we just uh, normalize it and then give different weights. Of course, if you have like, if you really know their relationship, then you can take a different approach. It depends on the domain knowledge. Yeah. 
Uh, what do you mean by continuous parallel coordinates? Oh, continuous parallel coordinates is a uh, technique that get uh, invented recently. So for the parallel coordinates, it's a map one individual data point as a polyline. And then, for example, if we have volume, although the volume we see each individual voxel, but actually they are sampling from a continuous uh, field. So if we map that continuous field to that parallel coordinate space, <coughs> actually we should also see that continuous distribution. So this is a kind of what we call the continuous parallel coordinates. It's oh, so like the coordinates themselves are just key. Uh, yeah, coordinates is, is a continuous parallel coordinate means those lines, they are not individual lines. Actually, they are like a, a continuous, like a tone. So we could also think about like this many, many lines. We put them together if we have a sample dense enough. But uh, for the speed of uh, drawing or like, rendering, we don't draw that many lines. There are other ways of interpolation to draw that continuous parallel coordinates. And the MDS could also be continuous. Um, so it's the idea, um, so just to see if I understand this correctly. So each coordinate you can think of projecting all the data on the one axis. Yeah. And then the, one, and, and one then the next and the next quarter you're projecting onto a different axis, and by continuously rotating between these two axes, and you're seeing how the projection of the data varies as you do this. Is this the right? Uh, it's it's the 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 for the continuous parallel coordinates, it's the same as parallel coordinates you can consider. So just the continuous parallel coordinates just used for like many points. If we have uh, so many data points, we use continuous parallel coordinates. But for the understanding, you, you can just forget about the continuous parallel coordinates. You just consider this a discrete type. Uh, so it's just a uh, fast way to yeah. do visualization. Yes. OK. Yeah. And it is also great for the volume data, because for the volume data, although it's standard, it's great type. But the underlying view actually is a, okay. it's a, like a continuous view. OK, OK. So that's the, uh, it's still the same. So this is the one, this one. But for the MPS, so we do the similar thing. And then we can use this one. We could specify some rank here or some like parts in the MPS plot to specify our transformation. So it's like here. We could specify like this uh, four clusters. And then we found out we have different distribution along each uh, dimension axis. So let's look at how we do here. So for example, we select this one, we could see how the, the corresponding occupation in that 3D space. Now the here, <coughs> so one trick here we want to care about is for volume, there could be like millions of uh, data points. Then we have to do some something. We could not afford to draw all those lines. So we use those uh, like continuous parallel columns and for the MPS here, we only subsample like 2%, uh, 200% um, of uh, the original data. So otherwise, we could uh, get very slow. So for this one, we get some really common response. Or like if we really want to focus on certain region, we can increase the sampling rate of that part. So it could, could also be like improved. So like here, we are not only be able to click here, we can also draw some here. For example, we can remove this part, it gets like removed in the transformation. So this is like two-way traffic. We could edit in the paraconics part. We could also edit in that, uh, the render image part. And we, we have further work on how to directly edit in on this render image one. So for this one, the good thing is here for the MPS one, we can directly circle some part, and we don't need to like uh, manipulate each uh, dimension. It's a kind of a tedious work if we have like ten of uh, dimensions to we want to work with, and it's a kind of a shortcut. So this is the whole system pipeline, and uh, we could apply it to uh, the hurricane data. And if we look at carefully for each component. We can see it could separate different features of that audience data. Of course, if we have some domain expert, they have certain knowledge on it, it could help us to guide much quicker 
and a better understanding of the data by using such interface. And this one has already been used by a few <coughs> research institutes in China. They work on like uh, the climate change and the, the atmosphere like the prediction, the weather prediction. And this is the, like, for example, this one, it's, we could say it's a low pressure and have different values. If we change a little bit, we see they have different geometry of application. And this one could be extendable. And note here, we could also use that MDS tree or <coughs> MDS uh, matrix, that method. But part of here, if we want to focus more on that uh, subspace dimension, if we have many parameters together, that one is especially useful for that uh, pollution research. For the pollution, there's a number like uh, 100 or 200 different types of pollution, and then they correlate with each other very tightly. So this is our ongoing work. We're working on that global pollution. And we can see how they decompose. And this could also be used for 2D image, because for 2D image, we can consider they are the same. And if we feel those like a high multi-band of those uh, satellite image, we can in a similar way map each one onto that each dimension. And we could class them together and build them together. Of course, here, the, <coughs> we don't consider the registration part. Assume all those images, they are already part of them, registered to each other. Yeah. And uh, we could, uh, this is a few real example, and we select some part. This is like uh, the same data, but we give them different weight of a different dimension, and then we can see, we can find out different grouping of those pixels. It really depends what kind of uh, dimension, what kind of channels we want to consider. And we put that together in this uh, with uh, those uh, seismic events. So in the seismic research, there are one hypothesis. So for certain uh, data, we can <coughs> that one, actually it's a ionic density. It's corresponding to some uh, event of earthquake. And then there's uh, one French uh, satellite, actually they do this work. So our work is we want to put those together and provide a visual analytics environment for those uh, systemic uh, research people. So they know that if there's an earthquake happening and what happened to those uh, like, uh, images uh, received by the satellite. So this is uh, some ongoing work. Uh, this one we published uh, last year's space and uh, we have uh, another one is preparing. So we work on that uh, French satellite. But unfortunately that the French satellite is stopped working last year. So, but the good news is like uh, China gonna launch another one after two years. So we hope we get every NASA software ready before the launch of that satellite. Then they can directly use it. So there's uh, like uh, a national effort to understand that uh, systemic event related to other things. Although it's difficult to do the prediction, but it's possible to use a visual net tool to understand it. Because like uh, in the past few years, there are a few very serious earthquakes in China, also globally, like in Japan and many places we see a lot of that, like impact over there. And then we could also apply it to uh, traffic. So traffic, although as a first site, they may not be uh, multivariant, but we kind of we could map it to a multivariant problem. So this is a few image I took from the web, they described some, uh, something about baiting, so how many people have been baiting, you, you feel having there, you may know like sometimes the traffic is very bad, and you can see the train, those are like the buses, it's like a train. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's in the morning. So normally I come like uh, pretty late, I don't want to get jammed into that heavy traffic. So. One, one thing is like we really want to understand such a traffic. So one way, uh, uh, like this is uh, some other, like uh, from called uh, OpenStreet Project, I guess on the web, so we can see it's another city, 
in Lisbon, we can see uh, from like, Monday to Sunday, they're quite different. And Monday and the, the Saturday and Sunday, there's almost no traffic. But in Beijing, Sunday and the traffic, we see much more traffic because like, uh, from Monday to Friday, there are restrictions on the flight. You can only fly, fly four days. So you have to one day leave your car in your home. So one of my colleagues, uh, she uh, working on that uh, sensor, this sensor. So we sense the footprint of uh, like any move object across uh, the street. So this is uh, one uh, cross section nearby our university. So that part is uh, Peking University. And this uh, street, so this is one one way traffic. So the traffic can only go from here to that part. And then we, uh, we have other other ways <coughs> to see. It's a little rotate here. This one corresponding to here. So when you should rotate, like 90 degree here. So this is the that one. And uh, there are a few sensors play. This is a laser scan. It can scan all those move objects. And then all these six scans, the data could be combined. We could have found out the control of each move object. So this is the kind of like uh, the raw data. Then we see this is like a, likely a car, and this is also a car, and uh, some, this is a kind of uh, like walking people. So this is the original data set. And all together, we collect the two day of the data from early morning, 7 o'clock to 9 p.m. And we couldn't get more because for each data collection, we need to have a lot of people stay there. Otherwise, other people, they are curious, they may block that the view. Yeah, because they never see it. So that's the thing. Okay, so altogether, we have around like uh, 200,000 these uh, trajectory lines. And uh, this is the after through away some uh, unrecognizable points. And then we have uh, a visualization system we call the uh, triple vista. So we use the three ways to observe and analyze the data. <coughs> so the first one is we have that geometric information and we map those trajectories and those lines according to their geometry distribution. And the second one is the same river. It's uh, embedded with uh, little more glyphs. I will talk about the glyph later. Then we can see how those traffic change around the time. And then the third one, we map the original data property into a pair of columns. In this, we convert those properties into multi-dimension, like uh, some data is not from the original one, because originally we only have those multiple points, so each time step, their position. But we can derive them into uh, many sub-properties. Okay, so this is the kind of interface we have. So for the first view, we can see how they change. And we have two rings over here, and each ring, they come with a histogram. So one is uh, like uh, in traffic, one, another one is out traffic. So we can see like uh, their statistics at a specified time. And the color here could correspond to the type of the traffic. And then, from this uh, same river view, we use a glyph. This glyph represents actually a pre classed one. So we know that a few directions those cars could turn left and right. And uh, there are a few points, means we could not classify it. So th then from this one, we can see different like uh, uh, <coughs> traffic type and how they change along the time. Of course, you know, here you see they have kind of like time pattern. They're kind of small, this is due to the track line. Yeah, this is the like, uh, we have such a type, and this is outliers. And for this one, we use some uh, sampling problems. Okay, let's go to the multi dimensional part. So we could uh, like uh, derive so many different types. For example, we could uh, specify the starting angle, the end angle, the speed, and how much time they stay in that uh, intersection, or like the turning angle, or the, the maximum speed, or the minimum speed. Actually, they mean uh, 
for example, before a car, they have a very high speed go to this one, or if their car, like if somebody stop in the middle, and then go again. So that tells a different story. So maybe there's a like, possible accident if their car <coughs> suddenly stop in the middle. Uh, and by this way, we can have those dimensions map to that parallel corners. And then we can see here, for this E and angle, actually they have a very strong correlation because there's a, like a, a few defined like twin angles. Of course, this is simple. But we could look at a few more other than this, like a very obvious correlation. For example, we can see like angle change. So normally for those cars, if we drive, normally we, we drive slowly and uh, move like a curve. We don't drive like this way and turn 90 degrees. So this is very real. And even for a passenger, you can walk along the way. Normally, it's not like a military people. Suddenly, it turns 90 degrees, only 100 degrees. So for normal, normal like people, they turn then let's look at some uh, data. They have a larger angle change of that curve. And then we could find out, after specify that, we could find out like one specific one. So this is, uh, actually this is a bicycle, this is a car. And here's like very some change. So we could, in that uh, pericolis view, we circle out and find like those uh, specific accidents Actually, it's not the accident yet. It's close to the accident. According to the students, they, they didn't say any big accident over the whole day. So it's uh, OK. But we could identify this one quite, uh, quite uh, quickly. And after we identify this one, we can also search the whole data and find out like, either or, like, there are some other traffic road. They have a similar like sounding chain. So we could label each one, they have given time, they have those one. And then this could let the user <coughs> further explore it. And then another story we could find out is we could like exploit your some sketch way to find out different moving patterns. For example, like this way, this is one way traffic here, we could not go other directions. Okay. Then we could uh, like use sketch draw like if is there like some uh, traffic go this way to here, and then find although for for like a uh, bicycle actually they come from here they don't like uh, follow that route but uh, probably it's fine so but uh, we found like a car that go this way it could also capture it so if we consider the angle it's go this way we. Figure out this is because here, this is the red light. Okay. So the car first <laughs> goes this way and then it looks like it follows through. So we identify this one. Of course, we don't have the video, we don't know the license plate, and we will not get it to the place. So. But we do find out some interesting patterns. And for those patterns, actually, it's not that easy if we directly without that visual manipulation. Even like uh, if you are not familiar with this driving behavior, you may not imagine some people can do this. Okay. So we could have found uh, like uh, more, for example, here this is uh, like, we clearly see this uh, like follow that uh, traffic light. So we have a stop and the game stop and the game. Okay, there's more, and uh, currently we work on uh, the taxi data. So for each taxi, there's a GPS on that uh, uh, the taxi. <coughs> and then we could track all those taxis they are driving around. Now we have a much uh, larger scale. So this is uh, just a density map. I just want to show this uh, data. So it's a still, we're still like uh, kind of uh, expanding our like, peer resistance to this one. So like here we can say different time, they have different like uh, zoom of uh, heavy traffic. So for the early morning, uh, actually it's not that early, it's at nine o'clock. So we see that part, and uh, it's, that one is already past the high traffic part. And then later, in the normal actually, we see there's much more, maybe people go to lunch or somewhere, and the afternoon, 
yeah, the light is, uh, is better. So the color is uh, indicate different, like uh, heavy. We use um, that uh, hidden map, actually uh, proposed by the Van group. We use it to rewrite the vessel. So we apply it here, and uh, this data set is around like, 100 gig gigabyte per month. So consider like uh, for a whole year, we could have one terabyte. This is just for one uh, city. Uh, so when you start with the GPS data, it's giving you some, some uncertainty of where the actual location is. You make any effort to snap it uh, onto so a far, particular uh, road? So far, not yet. Okay. Yeah, but it could, it, it actually, it should work out that one. Um, the last thing is like, uh, if uh, it's a depend, really depends how we want to uh, look at our data set. So sometimes we want to snap to our that uh, exact uh, Paths, exact road, but sometimes maybe we only want to care about that region. Whereas, but you know, look at some parts like uh, we could, uh, this is not that you say we go to a previous one. So here, you see those three lines. Actually, this is a data arrow. So there's a jump between those ones. Sometimes the car, like, the turn off the GPS, all the GPS got like. Uh, some problem and then they, it doesn't work and after one hour it's on, it's on again and then we see that they jump. So this is not a really continuous one. And for the most continuous one we can clearly see actually the form, the silhouette of such a, like an important road. So this this is the one still on there, so I don't have uh, more result right now, but for such data it's uh, very interesting to uh, explore it. And uh, if there's uh, some data in the US, I would like to compare it with. So if uh, here someone working on the traffic. Okay. So, and then we can also apply to Hurricane. This is a quite common data set. And uh, we found that it's uh, useful to identify some like, data error very easily. This is uh, from that pillar calling. We found that it's the total like the length is time of uh, that hurricane pass. It's uh, that's uh, extremely long. Then we find out this is some original data error in Bellevue. And then we could have found out some uh, interesting one, but this is uh, the same system as the traffic one, but it just applied to a different data set. And the same uh, pair of colonies embedded with MPS, it could also use uh, for those genome like classroom. They want to see how much genome they contribute to each disease for the diagnostic purpose. And could also use it for RFID. This is like for the detector, they have different configuration. So if we have multiple detectors, then each one, their configuration, there's a multi-dimension. And then with a few uh, uh, simulation, they could use a similar uh, interface as a user to figure out which configuration is better. So, this is uh, some, some work, there is one. So I do I have a final answer? Okay, so now, now I just uh, work through a little bit how we apply this uh, use uh, transformation. So above, we all talk about the multi-dimensional, so we use the parallel corners. So this one is just a little different. I feel it's interesting, so I want to share with you if uh, some of you didn't go to the base uh, two weeks ago. So for the volume rendering, and uh, we, one way is uh, just uh, we could clone the trans function, but another way is we could directly hint on the final image. So we want to touch the result instead of uh, touch that parameter in the parameter space. So that makes it easier, especially for someone who never see a uh, volume element before or they never see that trans function curve before. So just uh, you call it what you see, what you get, or could be another name, what you sketch it, what you get. So the difference is all the operation is on the final random image, and it could also be used for such a flow visualization. For, for example, flow, we can remove some parts, and of course, it's, you, you need to have a little bit of knowledge, you know, we have to remove. If you don't have, you can just brush the file. It's like Photoshop, you can just paint it with a different color, so like you can 
erase some part and paint with different color, change the, uh, change that uh, uh, their like uh, brightness, or like you can make it blur, and even like you can add some uh, silhouette right here. So all can be done on that final image. So this is a uh, like, oops, this is the bad news. Sometimes it's a stop here. So like, maybe I think like it want me to stop here. So let me see. Okay. So this one is like uh, just uh, the same, uh, like a kind of a similar idea we had uh, like in 2005. We that time we do a uh, segmentation work on like uh, that uh, random image. So basically, we sketch and then we you get what do you get? This is the this is not the slice. So. so I open the multiple one. I skip the uh, slides. So that time we work on like uh, specify the segmentation. Now this we want to make it like more like full functional. Not only the segmentation, we want to make it be able to pin the color and do other like performance. For example, we could erase that one, just when it erase it, we gradually change the opacity as we move downward. It could also peel it. One. So we have different effects. For example, this duration. And we also can apply color. Now the color, you, you don't need to specify the whole region. You just uh, like color paint some parts. You can immediately get all the same region the color. And this is the global operation. And uh, we currently work on a local operation that we could get local printing and also global printing depending on where you, we want to go. And it could also change the uh, transparency, make it uh, like uh, more opaque. And uh, can also change the brightness. So can change the contrast. So yeah, like we bring a few terms to use the Photoshop to achieve. So instead of like we change that magic curve. So basically we have a few basic operation and we could derive a few more like use our like, uh, some uh, method we put them together. And the color operation is like we specify some part and then it can distinguish the background and the foreground. So that's uh, like a kind of uh, we need to guess. So what's the user's intention? So basically this user uh, uh, coherency. So we have assumptions. So user always first draw on something they can see. So visibility play a, a quite an important role here. And then we also, like for that continuous part, we all, they always draw something like they occupy a large space around. They will not draw like a, kind of a here, there's a much more appearance over there. So based on few assumptions, as it turns out, our operation is quite robust, and uh, we could always, almost always get this one. And we also put it on iPad, but this one, they really not to like implement too much on the iPad. It's just to transmit the image because that operation competition for that uh, operation is very expensive. Because it's need to work through real time. We don't want to say too much delay. So basically here is like map the operation of the hand and the finger, and then we transmit from a server to our like uh, the iPad. In very good. And uh, so this is the we could touch it. So this is the finalized my talk here, and uh, this is my students, although uh, many of them are yeah, still have very students. So,
and uh, also for those projects I mentioned, I work with a few people, uh, some in the US, some in China, and some, uh, hopefully, we could have someone in Utah in the near future. Okay, thank you. Thank you.